So again, today, we begin this series on Ephesians. And both campuses are going to go through this together, and we're calling this series Resilient Faith. Over the next 11 weeks, we're going to look at Paul's letter, and, and so much of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus is about growing up and growing in maturity in Christ and, and building a, a resilient faith, of teaching, how the, uh, teaching the church in Ephesus how to live a, a faith of perseverance, a life of perseverance. And interestingly enough, uh, enough uh, Ralph Martin is a, a theological professor at Fuller Seminary, and he, he calls Ephesians a, a book of doxological hymns. Now, I'm sure we, we've all heard the word, the doxology, right? This is, uh, we, we used to sing this in church sometimes, praise God from whom all blessings flow. A doxology is a, a short hymn or a short song written and sung in praise of God and recognition of God and giving credit to God for who God is and what God has done. So then this book of Ephesians is, is a series of these little mini doxologies that Paul writes and then subsequently sings in recognition of God. So then for Paul, it's, it's those mini doxologies, it's those recognitions of God that serve as the foundation of faith, that serve as the foundation of resilient faith, that, that, that from there then, from this cornerstone of these doxologies grows up our faith. We can think about Ephesians like this as, as almost a, a training manual, a training manual of how to build a resilient faith, build a faith that, 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 is, um, uh, that, that maintains its structure, right, for, for growing up into Christ, even through times that are hard, even through times of adversity. So we're going to do that then together on Sunday, but again, I, I can't emphasize enough how, how cool it would be for all of us together to read through that reading plan. There's so much in Ephesians that what we're going to touch on here on Sunday morning is just, just the tip of the iceberg. So you saw on the screen this definition of resilient. This is kind of the definition that we're going to use as we walk through this series, and, and, and that, was, uh, that was this. That resilience is the capacity for a, a system or a person to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. Let me read that again. It's the capacity to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. This is what Paul hopes for, that no matter the circumstances, no matter what comes at the church of Ephesus and subsequently now us, that that, that faith maintains its core integrity and purpose. This is what I hope for for us together. This is my desire for us together as the church, maybe even more today than ever. Because we live in this time, right? We live in this super interesting time where our faith is put to the test and its resilient is, resilience is put to the test almost weekly. We live in this time where there's so many competing voices. There's so many competing voices trying to tell us what to do, what to think, what to get behind, what to say, what to believe. We live in a time where all of these things cause us to, to have the potential to, to, to go down a path that maybe our faith wouldn't lead us to. And these voices are strong, right? And, and let me be clear, I, I don't think our faith is being tested in the sense that maybe we don't believe in Jesus as our Savior, or maybe we are going to disconnect from church. I, I don't think that's what I mean, but rather I believe our resilience is being tested as we have to sift through all of these competing voices and we have to examine what it is that we truly believe so that then our lives can reflect our beliefs. As division rises, as contention rises between people and between systems and between families even, so does the need then for our own maturity and our own resilience. But remember too then that this maturity and this resilience that Paul writes about and that Paul desires and I hope that we all desire for ourselves it is not just an intellectual effort. It's not just an intellectual maturity, right? It's, it's not about what we know. We're going to see over the course of this series then that maturity and resilience doesn't come when we know more about Jesus, when we just know all the things. It doesn't come from more information. 
but rather it's about coming to a faith that's grounded in Jesus Christ in such a way that leads to a practical shift in life, a practical impact in how we live our life. Because, friends, if, if our faith is grounded in something that doesn't lead to a shift or lead to an impact in the way we live our lives, Scripture tells us that that's not faith at all. When what we believe lines up more closely with what we live and how we live, that is a sign of maturity and growth and resilience. That's a sign of a, a faith, then, that will not be swayed and will not be broken among all of these competing voices. So that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed over the next 11 weeks. Let's just start today. Let's jump in. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read together. If you have a Bible, you can open it to Ephesians 1. We're going to read through uh, verses 1 through 14. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow on screen as well. Hear the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things, according to his counsel and will, so that we, that so that we is important, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, when we look at these words, we look at this te text, I hold your word in my hand and I'm humbled. We're humbled that you make yourself known to us through the text, that you reveal yourself and your nature just a little bit. God, as we go deeper into this text, would you continue to do that? Would you open our ears and our hearts to receive what you have for us? God, we know that we don't do this in vain. By your Spirit, would you make it real and live to us? Would my words be your words, no more, no less? In Jesus' name. So this, then, is the foundation of all of the book of Ephesians. This is Paul starting Ephesians, the, the, the way that he's going to go through all of it. This is the cornerstone, and it helps us see, then, what Paul's shooting for here. Paul wants us to see right away that we are a part of, and that we're caught up in a much bigger picture than just ourselves and our own life. That, that we have, as people, as individuals, we have a much larger purpose than what we might initially think. And here's one thing I think is true. When we have this bigger vision of life, when we have this bigger vision of what God's up to, when we have this grand idea, when we see that, 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 that life and God's intentions for life are bigger than what we can even know, I believe that's the beginning of our resilience. That's the beginning of having a faith that's grounded, a faith that can withstand dra dramatically changing circumstances. 
Paul gives us then this blessing. Uh, it blesses God for all the things that God has done and, and kind of recounts all that God has done in sort of a chronological order then. And, and that gives us this big picture, right? This is big picture stuff that Paul writes about here. Verses 1 through 14 are just super big picture stuff. Way bigger picture than just us here in Hospers or even the church in Ephesus. This, this goes way beyond them. It's Paul looking back on God. Paul looks back to see what God has done, to see what God was up to, because that's what faith is built upon, right? To, to see how God has been faithful, how God has showed up, that's where Paul builds upon his faith. So today then, let's look back just like kind of Paul did. And let's ask three questions together. First, what has God done here? How has God done it? And why has God done it? We'll answer those three questions. Let's start with the what. Ephesians 1 says God has done lots, right? The what has God done? There's, there's a lot here. You'll notice a ton of action verbs. You'll notice a ton of things that were done, and, and all of them, God is the primary actor. Of all of the actions, God is the agent of everything being done here in Ephesians 1. So let's look down the passage, right? It's it's full of them. Verse 3, God blesses us through Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse 4, God shows us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be in communion with him. Verse 6, God bestowed glorious grace upon us in Christ. Verse 7, God has given redemption through the blood of Jesus and again says that grace has been lavished on us, right? Like, look at that word, lavish. Like, what a what a great word. In verse 9, Paul reminds us that God reveals himself in the person of Jesus. R right here in Scripture, right? God reveals himself in the person of Jesus. The, the best place to look to see the nature and the purpose of God is in Jesus Christ, right here in Scripture. All of those things, God has done. There's one more. There's one more in particular that I think is relevant to us and relevant to our uh, resilient faith that I want to say a couple things about. In verse 5, Paul writes that God destined us for adoption as children through Christ. We could make a whole sermon. We could have two whole sermons here about what it means to be a child of God and the word, even just the word destined, right? We could go into a whole sermon series just on this sentence, but we're not going to today. We'll try to get out by 10, 15. But I do want to say a couple things. For our purposes today, what is beautiful and what's amazing is this idea that God knew us and God loved us. And God desired to be in community with us from the very beginning. And not just wanted to be in commun community with us, but also made a way for that to happen through the person of Jesus Christ. Through Christ, you are a daughter or a son of God. It's amazing. It's scandalous, right? You belong in the family of God. You have a place. You have a home. You have brothers and sisters. You have a name greater than any other name you could bear, daughter or son of God. You have a family. You have a part in a family. You have a part in a greater story, right? This is it. You are a part of a greater story. You're part of a story that includes creation from the very beginning. You're a part of a story that includes God parting the Red Sea so the Israelites could walk through. You're a part of a story that includes God taking on flesh for you. You're part of a story that includes God pouring out his Holy Spirit to dwell in you. You're a part of every single story that we see right here. You are a part of this greater family. And not just a part, you're an active part. You're an instrument. God has given you a purpose. God has given you a, a, a reason, an intention, a, a direction as a part of this bigger story. So then in a real sense then, Paul is, is not just telling you all these things that God has done, but he gives this bigger picture of what God has done so that you may know. So that you may know the purpose so that we may see that God is even still at work. Even still today at work, gathering up all of the broken pieces 
back to himself. That's what scripture shows us. From start to finish, we see God's action to redeem his creation, and we are an active part of that story. I think the the most important thing that I want to highlight, though, is that this only happens, this resilient faith that Paul wants his audience to, 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 to grow and us to, this only happens because of what God has done. This is only possible because of God's action. This, this Christian life, this life of discipleship and following Jesus, this, this, isn't, a, this isn't a do-it-yourself. This isn't like a self-help improvement plan. This isn't a try hard and earn it sort of belonging into the family of God. All of this is only because what God has done. That's it. Only because what God has done. Sure, we respond in faith and we hopefully live a life that honors God, but we can only hope to do that because God has done something in us. Because God has gone before us. So that leads us to the next question of how. How has God done these things? How has God made you a son or a daughter? How has God bestowed upon you grace? How has God forgiven you? How has God brought you into this larger vision? It's, it's kind of a short answer, and Paul mentions it all throughout. He, he does it through Christ. That's the how. That's the short. I know that sounds like the Sunday school answer, but that is really the answer. In the first 14 verses of Ephesians, we see Jesus Christ mentioned either by name, title, pronoun, or a possessive mention no fewer than 15 times. In 14 verses, no fewer than 15 times. We see the words in Christ or in him in the passage 11 times. Paul is making no bones about it that Christ is the how. The in Christ and through Christ is the how God has done what he's done. Growing spiritually, growing resilience that only happens in Christ by his death, resurrection, and ascension. And by the Holy Spirit, then, we have union with Jesus. We're united with Christ. We're united in the same life, death, and resurrection. Just as Jesus lives, so do we. Just as Jesus died, so do we. And just as Jesus rose, so will we. But that's not all we're united with. As we find ourselves united with Christ, so wound up with Christ that that God begins to see us as Christ, we are also united in his mission. We're united in his purpose. This is, again, how we end up part of this bigger story. We're united with Christ. I want you to think about this, too, though. We've already talked about what it means to be a son and daughter. But look at Paul's words again. Paul says God chose us in Christ. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. So that means that you're not just sons and daughters now. You've been sons and daughters from the beginning. I get it, time and space, this stuff is hard, and it's hard to fathom, but think about this with me for a minute. Before time began, before God spoke anything into, in, into being, when there was nothing, even then, God had us in mind. Even then, God had already decided to make a people to call his own to make a people that would be his treasured possession. God had a a plan in mind for Jesus. A plan much larger. A a plan for wholeness and redemption and and, and bringing everything back to God. This is why we're here, right? This is why we're here to to bring redemption and wholeness to our communities. to, to, To bring the good news, to bring peace and rest to draw others up into this plan that God has for us, to bring others into this union with Christ that gives purpose and gives value and gives identity. This is why we're here, to get caught up into that with Christ. Just as God had a plan for Christ, that same plan is for us. Just as we're united with Christ in life, death, and resurrection, we are also united in plan and purpose. So that brings us to the last question. 
Why? Why has God done these things? Why is God gathering everything up back to himself? Why is God calling us son and daughter? Why, it, it, why has God marked us with the Holy Spirit? Maybe the better question then is for what purpose, right? But why has God done it is also kind of like saying for what purpose? Here's, here's the really clear truth. The purpose, the why, is, is not for us. It's not for us alone, right? It's not for our well-being. It's not for our comfort. It's not for our perceived prosperity. It's not so that we may have influence or power. Paul summarizes it like this. God does these things for the praise of God's glory. For the praise of God's glory. And this phrase reminds us why. This is a, a phrase for us to keep in mind as we walk through this series. And Paul uses it three times here. He destined us for adoption for the praise of his glory. Paul says uh, that, that we might live united with Christ for the praise of God's glory. That we've been marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Why? For the praise of God's glory. What does that mean? Let's break that down a little bit too. So praise Praise is a celebration of, of gratitude, right? It's a, a grateful celebration. And glory refers to the bright radiance of God's presence. So the praise of God's glory is a, a grateful celebration of the presence of God, of what God has done and what God is doing. Friends, this is what we're made for. This is it. This is what creation is made for, for the praise of God's glory, for the good purpose and good pleasure and good will of God. Quite literally, all of creation was spoken into being, according to Scripture, was spoken into being to bring God glory. I'm reminded of all the Psalms that, that talk about creation singing God's praise however they can. One way or another, creation will sing the praises of of God. And this isn't something we'll do later. This isn't something that we do when we see Jesus. This is something we're called into right now. This is our purpose right now, to live our lives in the praise of God's glory. From the very beginning, it's been our purpose, to live lives that praise. And then, as we're united with Christ, then it's our purpose then to draw others into this life of praise of God's glory. This is the turn, right? This is what we're called into, to invite others into the praise of God's glory. So that's it. That's the why. That's the for what purpose. It, it isn't for our comfort. It isn't for our prosperity. It isn't, again, for our influence or our power or our position. It's for none of that. God didn't do anything that God did or doesn't do anything God does for any of those reasons. Scripture tells us he does all of what he does for the praise of his glory. So then, a resilient faith, a faith that maintains its core integrity, is also a faith, faith that, that, that leads us to live into this bigger picture. It's a faith that understands that, that, that we don't live aimlessly, that we live as a part of this grander vision for life. But when we don't do that, when we don't keep that grander vision in mind, when we, when we shift our focus to ourselves, rather than fixing our eyes upon Jesus and fixing our eyes on what God is doing in the world, when we live aimlessly, when we live without this bigger picture in mind, that's when we start to get blown around. That's when we start to get pushed around when things run into us, right? Sometimes I don't want to say when we run into things because sometimes it feels like things run into us. But when we live sort of self-centered and not keeping this big picture in mind, that's when we start to get rocked and blown around. And, and maybe worst case, maybe that's when we lose stamina. Maybe that's when we give up. Maybe that's when we stop living lives that give praise to God's glory. Maybe that's when this is the hardest, and maybe that's why this is so important. Maybe this is so important. Maybe resilience is so important because of the tough times. 
the reality is it's not a question of if if life gets hard. The reality is it's a question of when. I mentioned it last week, and I would imagine this week is the same. There's probably not one of you in the room that haven't experienced difficulty or pain. And frankly, then the only way to make sense of any of that, the only way to find any hope through any of that is to realize and remember that that we are a part of this greater plan. We are a part of this bigger picture that sometimes we don't e- even get and maybe never will. But it's, it's, it's when we understand that, when we realize that, when we come to this place of saying with all of our being, with every bone in our body, we want to be part of this bigger picture. We understand that God is at work doing what God does for the praise of his glory. It's only then will our faith remain resilient. So let's ask ourselves today. Let's ask ourselves if if our faith is leading us to live a life that's oriented only towards the praise of God's glory. Let's ask ourselves if our if our faith is is built only upon these things that Paul reminds us of. Let's ask ourselves if our faith is only built upon what God has done and what God promises to do again. Let's ask ourselves then if we're living a life that's got this big picture in mind, this big picture of redemption and wholeness, knowing that God desires it for you and for me and your neighbors and your classmates and your coworkers, that God desires that deeply. Let's ask ourselves if our faith, if what we believe about God, let's ask ourselves if it's moved us to impact our lives and how. I mentioned earlier that Ephesians is this sort of doxological book, right? The, this group of many songs. Fun fact, verses 3 through 14 is one, in, in the Greek is one sentence. <laughs> Paul wrote all that. Thank goodness for the translators to give us some breaths in there, right? That's one sentence that Paul wrote. Paul wanted all of that expression of praise and gratitude and recognition. Paul wanted all of that to come out as one thought to God, about God, for God. Think about that. That's a long song verse. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's a, a doxological piece of recognition to God. And, and then I got thinking about music. I, I, I like music. I, I don't know about all of you, but I, I would imagine that all of you have songs that if they came on the sound system right now, they might take you back to a place. I know I have songs that will transport me instantly to a place. Some good, some bad, some places I want to be, some places I don't want to be, but, but they, they do that. So then it makes me wonder then if these are songs written by Paul, I wonder if these could be our songs. I wonder if Ephesians 1, 1 through 14 this week could be our doxology, could be our short song of him in praise. I invite you to that. Would you do that with me this week? Would you go through that reading plan so that this may be a song that that transports us back to a place, a place of grounding in Jesus Christ, a place of resilience, a place of maturity, a place of, of, of core purpose and integrity that is maintained through dramatically changed circumstances? Would you do that with me this week? The other thing I want to invite you to is that we are asking all of you to join with us in in some spiritual practices. Now, some of you have joined a triad uh, to do this with with some some people really intentionally during the week. But in your bulletins, even if you're not signed up for a triad, it's an explanation of a spiritual practice. Right? Each week is going to be a different spiritual practice, and and we believe that that part of maturing and growing and, and building this resilient faith it is leaning into new ways to experience God, new ways to hear the voice of God, new ways of putting ourselves in a posture to hear from the Lord and to be humbled in ways that we might not have done it before. So this week, we're going to ask you or invite you or give you the tools and the resources to practice meditation. I know there's some connotation with that word meditation, but the early church had it first, so don't worry about those connotations. <laughs> Um, meditation is, is really just 
sitting with the, with the text. Sit with the scripture. Read it over and over. Think about the words. Notice what words are used. Notice what words aren't used. Notice what you feel inside of you when you read it. Quiet yourself enough to notice what God might be saying to you or showing to you. That's meditation. So I want to invite you to do that with me today. And I'm going to pray in just a little bit, but after I pray, we're going to, we're going to do some meditation together. Laura is going to read some scripture to music. Just remember, may this be our doxology this week. May this be the song sung in praise and recognition to God. So, so as Laura's reading, as the band is playing, just sit. Just listen. Just notice. Notice the words. Notice what God is doing through them. So please, again, after we pray, just join me in that. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we come before you and acknowledge your, your sovereignty and your goodness. We acknowledge your, your actions in the past that, that give us faith of your action in the future. God, Paul's list of things here that you have done, God, we are in awe of them, and we're reminded of just the, the grace involved in all of it. So God, now as we shift a little bit and as we orient ourselves to hear the word proclaimed again, would you give us peace? Would you give us silence? Would you give us rest? Would you clear our hearts and clear our ears? And would you speak to us through it? Would you show us something? God, we love you for who you are and what you've done, and we are so grateful for the ways that you love us. In Jesus' name.